whoa, we're now with Will and his troubles, which he has a lot of. A lot of. <laughs> oh my God, his poor mom. I know. Yes. Oh, oh, I have so many like questions about his mom. Well, Here you want to. The main You want to. <laughs> you want to. Right? Okay. You ready okay. for this? Yes. Dun, 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 dun. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to the Amber Spycast, your one-stop shop for all things His Dark Materials. Your Dark Materials materialists are me, Alaric, Travis, and Joanna. We're back to talk about The Subtle Knife, the second book in this amazing trilogy. We loved reading the first book, The Golden Compass, and now here we are slicing through the subtle knife nice. uh <laughs> so joanna take us on our journey Ooh, and what a journey to start um so the subtle knife opens in our world where a young boy named will parry is bringing his ill mother to an elderly neighbor mrs cooper who reluctantly agrees to take care of mrs parry after leaving his mother, Will returns to his house and frantically searches for a green leather writing case filled with letters from the adventure-seeking father he's never met. Strange men have been coming to the house asking questions and looking for the case, and Will wants to find it before they do. Just as Will finds the letters, the men break into the house and one of them makes his way upstairs. Will rushes through the doorway, accidentally pushing the man down the stairs and killing him. On the run, Will makes his way to Oxford, where he hopes to have his questions about his father answered. Late in the evening, as Will walks down a tree-lined street, he notices a cat acting strangely. Upon investigating more closely, he is surprised to see a barely visible opening in the air leading into another world. Will decides to cross through the opening from one world to another. He finds himself on a strange, deserted street and seeks refuge in a small house where he encounters a feral-looking Lyra Silvertongue. Elsewhere, Serafina Pecola witnesses Mrs. Coulter torturing a witch for information about Lyra and kills her to prevent her from telling Mrs. Coulter what she knows. Serafina goes to Svalbard to speak with Lord Asriel's servant, Thorold, who tells her that Lord Asriel means to start a war with God. She flies back to her clan, where Lee Scoresby and Ruta Scotti, the queen of the Latvian witches, has joined them. Lee Scoresby says that he is going to look for the scientist and explorer named Stanislas Grumman. Serafina and her witches decide that they need to summon other witch clans to fight on Lord Azrael's side and protect Lyra. Ruta Scotti will go to Lord Azrael to see what he is really doing. Back in the New World, Lyra and Will meet two children who tell them that the city they are in is called Chitagaze. They say it, that it is filled with specters, which are wraiths that feed on adults but do not harm children. After speaking with them, Lyra and Will agree to go back to Will's world so Lyra can find a physicist who can tell her about dust. Once there, it is clear to Lyra that this is not her Oxford and her mission might take longer than expected. Travis, thoughts? That was a lot. Those, and not just because we read three chapters instead of our usual two. Mm -hmm. That was a that was a lot because so much happened, like so much happened. The um, firstly, I need to give, excuse me, hats off to Joanna for how you pronounced. Um, Chittagaze, because <laughs> I will tell you that is not how I pronounced it, but I know that I'm wrong. So. <laughs> I mean, there, it's, it's Italian, well, uh, right? I'm it's sure. Italian. I'm sure it's based on um, it's based on like a mix between Florence and Venice and mm -hmm. things like that. So yeah, I'm sure you're right. I'm just uh, awful. <laughs> so anyway, um, back to the book. Starting out with Will, the that that poor boy. You know, it's it just started off with like I so much heartbreak. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, you know I don't uh, not obviously, but uh, I don't um, I can't uh, fully empathize with uh, ev everything that he's going through. But um, it's it's just I just imagine myself, you know, doing in his position and uh the amount of uh, love and care he's got to, sh to show his mother who's clearly you know maybe a paranoid schizophrenic something along those lines it's uh it's tough but uh still still not sure that just uh dumping her off 
at a neighbor is the best thing to do, even though he's being chased by the men in black. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not I'm not sure that was the best choice for her. I don't know what what is a 12 year old or he's is he he's 12, right? Something like that. Mm -hmm. He you know, what's going through his mind what he doesn't think that he can move freely with her. He needs to put her somewhere and she can't be at home, uh, Mm -hmm. which is proven that night. Uh, right. if she had been there, who knows what would have happened. Uh, and shout out to his cat, by the way, because legit, I like your, your recap there, but you left out that the cat was ultimately the villain and that <laughs> I think the cat murdered, the cat murdered cat that murder. guy. I knew we'd bring it up. I knew we'd bring it up. Give the cat, give the cat its props. 100%. And you know, it's funny because it's a G. we're in a world without demons, but right away an animal plays a really key part mm-hmm. in this. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, oh, there's a little nod to... You know, these familiars that are around us all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a really harrowing scene, too. Not just the scene where, and, and how upsetting it was him dropping off his mom at uh, his old piano teacher's, you know. Um, right. and, and that sort of, she's so confused and so lost but willing to do what he thinks is best for her, even though he's such a young child, uh, mm-hmm. was just heart heartrending and heart-wrenching. Uh, and knowing how sad Will was to do it. Yeah, I think the the urgency of that situation is made apparent very quickly. I don't think it's what he would have wanted to have done. I don't think he really wants to do it, but he knows he has to. You know, there's this one part where, in the, in the just the first few paragraphs, where they say that the the neighbor notices that Mrs. Perry has makeup on one eye, mm-hmm. but not the other, and that mm-hmm. Mrs. Perry didn't notice it, and Will didn't notice it. So, you know, that he 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 snatched her or drug her out of the house very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think was probably panicky and was just like, ah, like, you, you know, you. Um, but, yeah, the amount of responsibility for that kid is just, you know, I can't even begin to, to imagine. Um, yeah, I just can't even begin to imagine it. Think about yeah. that game that they played at the grocery store. Right. Mm-hmm. And how his his recollection of that, it was really just you know, it gave me chills to think about going through that as a very young child. I think he might have, he was like seven or eight at the time. Mm-hmm. It just broke my heart. Yeah, it just broke my heart that a seven or eight year old has to go through that. Yeah. Alone, because mm-hmm. his father is question mark. Lord yeah. Asriel, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying I'm just saying that's my guess right now. He's an explorer, yeah, is he, he not? He, He's an explorer who just vanishes from time to time. Mm-hmm. You know, any port in a storm, right, Lord Ezreal? Yeah, man. Uh, so he, Will goes back to the house after dropping off his mom, and he is looking for something that uh, is hidden. He's looked basically everywhere, mm-hmm. Um but he is looking for a leather bound binder, a green leather bound mm-hmm. binder, interesting mm-hmm. color uh, that is notes by his father. And, and uh, what else is in there? I mean, I think they just, I think they legit just say like letters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I think, they, but, um, but who knows what's in there? He I hasn't mean, really looked at it yet. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I love it because he, he, you know, he, he was being respectful like he knew they were important to his mother and he was like, I wouldn't like, I, I won't look in it yet. Like he yeah. knew not to look in it yet. Like he gave her that space. Yeah. That was yeah. something very special to her. It was something that he was very aware of. That was the most important thing to her in the entire world, maybe mm-hmm. besides him. But it's also telling the kind of uh, role that he has where he's in the position to give her space as opposed to, you know, in most houses, oh, I'm not going to touch that. That's mom's. You know, I don't want mom to yell at me. Mm-hmm. In this case, you know, he's given the, the 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 agency here to determine whether or not he'll have that space because he's got to be the adult in the relationship. Right. Right. So these men in black show up, break in. They're intruding. I mean, honestly, you know, when when ultimately this guy, when he pushes this guy down the stairs, shout out to the cat. Uh, he, these guys were intruders in his home, right? And right. like he's saying, I'm a murderer now. They're going to be after me. Who knows who these guys are? But they had broken into his home, and as far as we know, he's defending himself and defending <laughs> his home. 
If this had been Florida, he'd be perfectly fine. That's standing your ground, right? That's right. Stand your ground, man. And this isn't the first time they were in there. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, they constantly. Yeah, they came there multiple times. Harassing. Bully, them. yeah, bullying and harassing, mm -hmm. and and each time it was so. I loved reading that part. Each time, Will like stood his ground, kind of got fierce, and they, I mean, these men respected it, or at least. I don't know what, and they and they would leave. They would leave each time, which I thought yep. was really interesting. Why would they ever leave just because a twelve-year-old like puffed out his chest and was like, "Bring it," you know? But yeah. they did. Yeah, they would question his mom, and he couldn't be in the room. You know, they were mm -hmm. like, "Oh, your your child," but he'd be right there, just outside the room, listening. And as soon as things started to turn, he went in there and kicked them out. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so weird. Who are these guys? I think there's some there are people who know that he's important for something. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly his father. Certainly, or his father. certainly his father. Yeah. But right. I, I wonder if uh, that that uh, conveys to Will in some fashion. Just because I mean he gives those orders and they leave. He's the one who uh, gets puffed up, and you know maybe they're not allowed to pretend to harm him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the writing here. So now we're, this is the first time that we've been living with someone else. How did that strike you after reading a whole book really focused on one person? POV, POV shift for me was pretty jarring. It, me not, too. Not in a negative way. No, not me either. Not in a negative way. It was just like, you know, uh, like one of those smash cuts when you're watching a movie. We're going to cut over to this guy now. And uh, it took a, a little bit to adjust to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had to read it twice. And the first time I read it, it wasn't that I disliked it, but I just, I couldn't sit with it. So mm -hmm. I had to take a minute and then I had to come back to it and read it again. Um, mm -hmm. Cause I like to read through once and then I go back and I make my notes because I don't want to miss, mm -hmm. you know, anything. Um, but it did, it took, it took the second time for me to feel like comfortable. He, you know, just having it be from that, from that point of view. Mm -hmm. I missed, I missed her. I missed her voice actually quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I was really, it wasn't that I, again, it wasn't, I didn't like it. I was, you know, really into it, but I, yeah, I was like, where, where, you know, where's my girl, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think it's also, you know, the, the golden compass starts out where she's like, she's running around and she's hiding. It's very lighthearted. You know, she, she and Pan are like, he's like, don't do it. She's like, let's, we're going to go hide. And even though some, you know, some, some maybe scary things might happen, maybe they'll get caught and then they see the, the poisoning. I mean, for Will, it's like a life and death kind of thing immediately. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the other part of it is the, to the actual tone of the writing is, is much more serious in the beginning here. There's mm -hmm. no like getting to know them in this light kind of whatever way. It's like you are thrown right into his chaos from yeah. the get-go. This is our world. This is now real world, whereas Lyra's that story and how it began, it felt like a fantasy. Mm -hmm. It felt like we were reading a fantasy book. Then all of a sudden, we're... You know, we're in an episode of Black Mirror or something. Like it's 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 us. It's our world, but different. Like slightly different. Mm -hmm. uh, it is our world, but it just feels there's something different about it. Well, it's our world, but we're um, kind of given uh, gi given a glimpse into an underbelly that we didn't mm -hmm. know was there. Right. You know, like when we're looking at liars saying, I think you, you guys hit it right on the head. It starts off feels like a fantasy right away. Feels like a fairy tale. And then we get into to this book and it's right in the middle of our world. And like Joanna was saying, you know, it's life and death. It's not just life and death. It's like a very ugly, not ugly, but it's a very tough life mm -hmm. and death. Right. Yeah. And, you know, what's interesting about his life is they appear to have some money. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what his mom did. Did, did. Is it mentioned what she did or does? I don't recall. I don't remember. If it does, I don't remember. He seems to have, like, you know, she has a bank account and he mm -hmm. draws money out of it. Um, so they're, they're, maybe they're struggling in certain ways, but it's hard to tell exactly, you know, how, what their financial situation is. Mm -hmm. uh, but if she's not able to work, it doesn't seem like she would be able to work in this state, especially as right. forgetful as she is. Um, and Will is basically cooking and shopping. He's doing everything. He's, he's running this family at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it does feel very real and very, very rough in that way. Yeah. I think there's, there's two, two possibilities there with the money. I mean, you know, one, I mean, they, they live in a country that has a social safety net 
And uh, two, um, adventurer father, does he send money home? Is there money in an account that that's his? Is he a wealthy person? We don't know yet. Right. right. That's what I was thinking, too. I was like, maybe there maybe he's sending with those letters. Maybe, you know, things are coming coming in for her that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, because because uh, Will gets quite a bit of cash just oh, at yeah. the ETF. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So the, you know, he, this guy dies, breaks his neck, I guess. And uh, Will runs out the front door. The other guy's just sort of like shocked, I think. The other, the other man in black is kind of shocked about what had happened. Will runs out feeling like he has, he has to get out of there. He has to hide. And in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of him running, he and hiding, he sees something a little unusual, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. What is that? Are you, okay, are you talking about the Burger King or the hole? Because well, <laughs> fact, well, the fact that there are references to it is again, it's very jarring to see to be in our world again. Yeah, because referencing like real world things is like, oh, okay, this is where they refer Coke. He references Coke he too, right? And, and it was so hard for me when he referenced. A Burger King, I was like, oh, you are in a bad place, aren't you? <laughs> You're going to have to go eat in a Burger King. Oh, man. Hey, have you had the Impossible Whopper? Don't knock it, it until you try it. It's, it is it's delicious. It's I real good. It. Yeah. But, so are, uh, you talking, are you talking about the other thing? Well, let's talk about the kitty cat okay. and the kitty cat going over to the hole. <sighs> I got to tell you, I'm a sucker for that stuff. I love the whole, oh my gosh, he just put his hand through the air and now his, half of his arm's gone. I love that whole, that, that whole gimmick. And, um, you know, with a cat, it's just, it's, it's, I don't know why, but it just seems adorable. It was, it's, the sequence was very funny where it's very cat-like in a way where this cat's like freaked out by it initially and right. then like freaked out and curious and then curious and then it just walks right through. <laughs> it's like, right. that's just what a cat would do. His back's all arched. And he's... Yeah, kind of puffed up <laughs> exactly. and then goes through, you know, because yeah. that's what a cat would do. Yeah. And again, animals playing really an interesting role in this, in this world, you know, just from the, na the narrative. And Will goes, checks it out. And it's a patch of grass that he sees through there, but slightly different patch of grass, something that he knows in his bones is different, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was interesting. And in the interest of, interest of hiding, he goes right on through. Right. So I don't know I that I would have done that. I was about to say, I was about to ask, um, I'm, I'm going to pull the group right now. Would you have done it? <sighs> 50, if 50. I was in Will's situation, well, if I believed what Will believed that yeah. he he was now a murderer and he was going to be captured and tried and whatever as a murderer, uh, maybe I would. Okay, but you're you. I, what do you do? Uh, I think I would do more trial and error. Mm -hmm. I would I would kind of like uh, throw something else through. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who knows? Can I breathe the air? Like I don't know what I'm looking at. I think I would do a few more tests before I really step through, but I would be, I'd be thrilled yeah. and excited, but I don't know if I would go right through. He goes right through. He does. I mean, a 12 year old Joanna would have gone straight through. You uh, think? I, and yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that 12 year old Joanna would have just been like, what? And <laughs> right through. Um, this Joanna would be like, well, I have school in the morning and I don't know if I, do I want to go through that hole? Will I get back in time for my, you know. Could you find oh, your way back? What if you I went know. through and it closed? Right. You I don't even it. know what it is. I love it. I love the idea of this hole. I love that it's barely visible. Like you have to, like you can walk around it and it's totally not there, but you mm -hmm. just catch it at the right angle and it's like you can just kind of see it. Um, I will say, I know you guys love the cat. I, I didn't love the cat. And Travis, <laughs> I want to give you a trigger warning here. I'm going to talk about um, Endgame. Oh, I know where you're going oh. with this. Yeah, close your ears. Fair enough. Gee. I can handle like it's like It's like the rat that runs across and all of a sudden he's like, Pow! and it comes out. I'm like, really? Like you are, you happen to find the, cat is in that same spot where you are and and i guess there's not really another reasonable way for him to find it but i was just kind of like cat ex machina <laughs> you, you darn cat i, I respect I, I fully respect that opinion that that certainly is again like 
I guess it could have been written where he just saw it. Um, you know, the, the glint of a different world, you know, that he could see, but it has to be so unseeable. Mm -hmm. Something has to show him. Uh, otherwise everyone would just see it. Mm -hmm. You know, he talk, they talk about the cars driving by, they're never going to notice it. Um, so I, I guess, you know, it happened. That's how he wrote it. Um, but I'm glad that Will found it because now we get to go into Chittagaze mm -hmm. and see this amazing, interesting alien world that is, again, so much like what we know and yet so different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love the like... vacantness of it. Right. The Omega Man of it initially. Yeah, the emptiness really threw me. I was really expecting there to be something along the lines of, uh, I don't know, it, it uh, just not being a populated world. I was not expecting to at some point see people. Um, I don't know why, but uh, for some reason I just didn't expect that we would see people that maybe, you know, it's uh, it being uh, some kind of weird nexus or whatever. But instead it was like uh, a place that had uh, some problems. Yeah, very much so. I mean, it almost felt like the snap had happened here. You know, uh -huh. it's like, where is everybody? They're just gone. Uh -huh. uh, but like, th there were there people there recently. There was risotto that was mm -hmm. sitting out that was like not quite turned yet, but gonna turn soon. Mm -hmm. um, they electricity worked. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, milk had milk was still edible. Coke uh, was still egg, cold. Coke was still cold and delicious. Mm -hmm. um, Lyra pretty much loses it over Coke, Coke like <laughs> big time. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's strange. But Will is, I felt like very comfortable very quickly. He he's another survivor. We're seeing a another character that is like Lyra but different. She he's he's smart and he is um, he's streetwise i guess for lack of a better term mm -hmm. and is aware that this place is like the best hiding place ever mm -hmm. if he was needing to hide he's like uh, he couldn't have found a better place he could have mm -hmm. lucked into it or been destined to find it um but yeah the city is yeah it was wild yeah what's going on there it's the the thing is like it's not that different from our world, I guess, except without the major, um, this situation that's going on, that's making all the adults, you know, run away. But, uh, you know, just an aside, I, I, you know, I don't like to talk about the, the things that I'm writing, but the, the thing that I'm writing has classifications of alternate worlds based on the, the degree of variance between each world. And I feel like this particular world, you know, on a scale between Lyra's and Will's was probably dead in the middle. You know, mm. it, it had some significant differences from Will's, um, but at the same time had uh, a lot of uh, simil similarities. You know, yeah, like like, Coke. Like this world has like Britney Spires. It doesn't have Britney Spears. <laughs> right. For example. <laughs> right. <laughs> it has milk instead of milk. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the There's story. the 13th month <laughs> smart. <laughs> uh, but I do I do I, and I think that's I, it's one of the things I really like I think I like what you were saying Alaric because I think that um will is to me you know Pullman writes his characters and and his children characters in particular you know like and not quite the not quite the Mary Sue but just saying you know like how far can we push their ability or their, you know, um, to do these things. But Will is very believable to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've encountered kids like Will at my school. I've encountered kids like Will when, you know, um, when I was younger and working in like boys and girls clubs and tutoring and things like I knew kids that did that. And so in that sense, I feel like, um, you know, he coming into this world and him, you, you saying like he saw that it was a safe place, like immediately he was like, yeah, I'm going to stay right here. I have what I need. I still got my Coke. Those guys will never, like, nobody will ever find that. Who could mm -hmm. ever find that again? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. And I love the honor he has with uh, cleaning up after himself yep. and uh, paying for things. I like uh -huh. how Lyra's like, 
you know, why are you paying for that? She said it's so foreign to her. And he was like, well, you know, that's the right thing to do or whatever. And she's like, that's, she's like so not into that. Right. <laughs> like, I don't really get it. Not to jump, not to jump ahead to him, him meeting Lyra, but um, I just love their, their sort of back and forth about like how he's paying for things and cleaning up. She's like, cleaning up? You know, she's not into that. Nobody's here to, to, to yell at me. Why do I have to clean up? <laughs> So he um, explores a little bit and um, and then finds Lyra. And yeah. while Lyra finds him, she jumps. They, they kind of beat each other up a little bit. Pan beats up Will. Lyra, she's like feral, you know, uh-huh. and he punches her in the face. <laughs> and uh, then they sort of like recoil from each other and they, you know, eventually get a chance to speak to each other. Mm hmm. Uh-huh. Did you sense a connection right away? A comfort level? She had to ask Leithiamid or something that gave her much more comfort yeah. shortly after they meet. But I felt like they had a rapport pretty early on. I don't know that I would, I, I would say that. No. But Joanna, what do you think? Well, what I'm thinking is that I feel like like, I would agree, I think, a little bit more with you, Travis. Like, I think that when they encountered each other, I mean, what I loved was that, first of all, uh, Will instantly recognized that he was he was the opposite of, like, his situation. Like, mm-hmm. he was like, I am the weird guy coming up these stairs, and he knew somebody or something was behind that door, yeah. and he wasn't exactly sure what. And so then he, he even took the time to, like, position himself little, <laughs> yeah, to differently. Be, like, on the, like, not quite in front of the stairs. So when she did jump out, you know, he he didn't. Uh, fall. Look, he looked for cats. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I feel like, you know, Will is so strong. I think, I think that Lyra is like almost like fat, fat, like fascinated by him. Mm. You know, th- this guy, this kid isn't Roger. He's not going to roll over for her the way all these other children like rolled over because she said go. So they go. Mm-hmm. And I think that you know, when she, when, when he kind of pushes back, not just physically, which I think she probably would be used to physically mm-hmm. having some of that, you know, but when he is just like, who are you? Why are you t-? like, I don't think she was used to that. And I think that kind of like affronted her for a minute. And yeah. I think it took her, I think it's one of the reasons she asked the alethiometer, the thing that she asked it. Mm-hmm. And then while it, I think what I love about that next sequence then is we see how she starts to figure Will out which is a cool thing too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I don't think they had an instant connection. Yeah. You know, almost, I'd almost feel like they were like, yeah, I, I'm going to agree with you, Joanne. I, I feel like they were almost like opposite numbers, um, not necessarily um, connected, but uh, you know, they, 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 they were in, in, not necessarily in opposition when I say opposite, but uh, you know, Two sides of the same coin, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So they they have a meal. She sees him cook uh, an omelet, which was six egg omelet. Sounded pretty good to me while I was reading it. That sounded huge. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, it's pretty I was good. Like, how are they eating? I, I can't eat a six egg omelet. <laughs> Not like four times their size. Well, they split it, but yeah, it's I split. can eat a three egg omelet. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, have some cokes mm-hmm. and uh, chat a little bit. Uh, it's it's interesting to sort of see this this relationship starting out and 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 as you guys were saying, I'm not, I don't necessarily disagree. I was just thinking that um, could they be the only two kids in the world? You know, like they don't really know what's going on yet um, before they you know they see anyone else. Um, but Will is, is, he's so comfortable and so confident. And so, um, he's cared for people in the past. So it's so natural to him to sort of automatically take care of someone else, even if it's, it doesn't matter who it is. He recognized her as being, you know, stick thin, hungry, filthy. Um, I think he wants to help a little bit. Uh, but Lyra, you know, Lyra asks the lithiometer, tell me about this kid. And like, oh. The lithiometer is not very helpful, by the way. The, the two times she uses it, it's like, come on, bro. <laughs> what, what is this? Uh, he's a murderer? Okay, thanks. 
Yeah. But but that gives her comfort, which I thought I thought was kind of an interesting little note. Mm-hmm. But the second time she uses it, it's like pathetic. I forget what, it, what I have to look it up. Do you remember what exactly it says? I don't remember exactly what it says. No, I'd have to look it up too. Um, I, I, what I and while you're looking that up, I, I think like, you know, he knows how to be the adult. Like he's had to be the adult, and so he takes that role. I think you're absolutely right. Um, but what I love about it is he's not he's not lovingly taking care of her. Like he's like, why didn't you wash your hair? She's like, yeah. I ain't have to. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know how. You know, the, the servant her. does it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and he was like, you got to wash your own hair. Like, like you know, he, and I love the way he sort of put her in her place. Um, and but I on think the other that... hand, wasn't he a little imperious? Like, I felt like he was a little too, too bossy. Like, I think I'm, I'm a little possessive of, uh, protective. I get not possessive, but protective of a uh, liar at this point. Cause I was like, you're a little rude to her. You're a little rude to my girl. You need to step off. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't like the way he addressed her. Mm. What a, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I think I've been reading this, spending too much time in this world. <laughs> <laughs> Back up off my girl. You <laughs> can we talk about his reaction to pan? Oh yeah. Yeah. He's like, yeah, that, that, that puts him on his heels a little bit. And that's before Pan even talks, which yeah. really, really messes him up. Mm-hmm. The shape shifting and all that other stuff. And Lyra's like, what do you think? He was a pet? <laughs> yeah, that was really funny. <laughs> but, you know, Lyra was, has, shows her, her wisdom when she's, when she's like, oh, well, you, you just don't, ha- yours just isn't on the outside. You still have one. Right. It's just right? on the inside. Because she had that initial reaction for her was like, why are you not like mindless zombie? He's not broken. Yeah. yeah. She's like, what? I don't understand. I can't, I can't see your demon. And then she kind of realizes, oh, then it must be on the inside. Right. Yeah. Which I thought was so, such an amazing observation. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I mean, like, I feel like she just, cause she, she came to that conclusion because of the way he, he spoke to her and how engaged he was. And there was just, and she basically saw his soul in the way he engaged with her. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I wonder, it, it kind of made me, made me feel like, you know, that's, that's an ability she has. Cause we always see it, you know? And I think we've, uh, we've all, a lot of times, and she even does it in here. She attributes it to being able to see the demons. Cause she talks about how it's easier if you can see a demon. But uh, I wonder if uh, that's not just who she is. She can, she can ferret out who, uh, who a person is really mm-hmm. quickly. Mm, yeah. yeah she she can read like not only can she read the alethiometer she reads people pretty quick yeah, and maybe that's why she can read the alethiometer right sure i mean look what she did to your your for rackinson mm-hmm. right so she, she read that that bear up and down <laughs> like a book <laughs> yeah read him wrote him and erased him. <laughs> uh so we jump we jump to um another pov yeah we get to see Serafina Pecola, our girl. We love her too, uh, and see her point of view. And we see she has she has a little adventure, doesn't she? Uh-huh. I mean, it doesn't stop. You, you know, like each chat, like you know, we move into Serafina, and we st- and we get hit with just the same kind of a of a bang as we do with Will when we first. You know, we know who Serafina is, but we pick up we pick up where she is, and things are happening. Yeah, you know, like like things are already happening. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, the things that are happening. It's it's like I, I turned on a movie in mid in the in the yeah. middle, and I'm yeah. like, uh, could you tell me what's happening? <laughs> For real. And she has to act very quickly. We don't really know initially who this witch is, except that she encounters the witch's demon, who is freaking out. Uh-huh. Uh, the demon can't find can't find her is confused and lost and needs Serafina's help. And Serafina says she'll help. Um, and Serafina ends up guiding this ship in through the fog. And there was another thing interesting was how much fog there is, of course, because of the, the, the splinter in the world, I assume because of the splinter in the world and right. the heat, the heat in the Arctic, I can only imagine that it's causing all kinds of havoc up there. Mm-hmm. And she um, hides on, aboard this ship and she sees Mrs. Coulter. Only if she finds out that they have a witch that they are torturing to find out more information. Uh, 
yeah, we get dropped in quick. And Serafina yeah. also has to figure stuff out quickly, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, since I, I've been doing this book uh, largely from uh, an audio perspective, the first time I, I read through this, it's usually um, on audio, and um, the performances in this particular section were just outstanding. Like listening to to this whole thing, um, the the torture scenes uh, were heart wrenching, gut wrenching. Oh God! Awful. Mrs. Coulter just breaks her. I mean, casually, just just breaks casually her broke her finger. It's like it, it that was stomach turning mm-hmm. and also without any emotion, emotion less. Mm-hmm. She has no reaction to it. Mrs. Culture, she doesn't even get mad at that part. She gets mad at like everybody else, but she's right. not even mad when she's interrogating her. She just does it matter of well, factly. And I think what I think, I think that's because right before that, Mrs. Coulter is talking to the Cardinal. Like she has this conversation with the cardinal, and the cardinal is super condescending to her. Oh yeah, you know, don't you know about this child? And you know, and, and then Mrs. Coulter even says, "Oh well, I'm a woman. How could I know about this? Like, why don't you tell me what I don't know about this child?" Mm-hmm. And I think she's so angry about that and can't do it to them. Can't you know say things that she could or would want to to the cardinal? So she takes it out on the witch. Uh-huh. she's just like crack 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 and that I, I really think that's where that comes from i mean it's still insane yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. you know yeah. don't get me wrong i'm not justifying it but i think that's why you know because it doesn't make sense to me for her to come in and just be like but like because usually she's charming you know right. usually she's she feels like she can manipulate you with the things that she says or how she how she engages with you and this one was just tell me now and mm-hmm. that was it yeah, so she's not just full of charm. She's a blunt hammer as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, looking at that line that you were just referencing, when she's like, I'm a woman, the, the line was interesting. She's like, you will have to speak, speak more plainly than that. You forget, I'm a woman, your right. eminence, and thus not so <laughs> subtle as a prince of the church. Like, ugh. Oh, God. Like she, you do, like, she's tired of being mansplained to. Uh-huh. I am not, I am not here for that. And I'm just going to break somebody's fingers. I know. Um, I might have broke some fingers, too. I don't know. <laughs> that would have made me so mad. Yeah. I typically yeah. like the villain. I, I appreciate villains, and I like what villains do in books, and I like how they're written, and there's a certain delight in reading about someone's villainy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm still not quite there with her. I still just really, she's, she's really awful. unsavory and really awful. Um, I like some of these things that she says and I like her, how strong she is, but man, I mean, you know, the witch is like, okay, I'll tell you. And then she just breaks another finger. Mm-hmm. You know, she's even like, okay, I'll, I'll just, just on a whim, she breaks another finger. During this whole sequence, maybe the most amazing feat of magic that we've seen up to this point takes place, which is Serafina disguising herself, making herself invisible, but not invisible. Uh-huh. Making herself um, unnoticed, yeah, present but unnoticed. People walk around her, you know, when they, they there's they know someone's there, but they don't really care. And how how taxing it is on her to do this, but she's mm-hmm. in the room while this is happening, and no one sees her, except when the torture starts happening. She breaks focus, and people notice her. And she has uh-huh. to regain focus, and they almost forget that she's there immediately. I found yeah. that to be, I love that. No, I thought it was fantastic. And I've only, see, I've only seen that in one other, well, or I should say I've only seen it. I've seen that in one other book that um, it was the exact same kind of thing. Neil Gaiman um, wrote a book called The Graveyard Book. It's one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite books. But the, but the boy in there, Bod, um, who was raised in a graveyard, he has that skill. He's taught by the ghosts in the graveyard, how to be unnoticed like that. So he can be just, he'll, he can just stand still and people will walk past him. Like he's not even there. And that's that, you know, when I read that, that's what she was doing. Um, but obviously she has that super, you know, she has, she's a witch. So she has that supernatural power to be able to do it. But the fact that it takes effort, I think is what makes Pullman's usage of it like awesome. Yeah, I loved it. I was thinking about see, like being able to see this in in action, you know, on screen. I th- uh, there was a character in Fringe that did this that uh, existed just. It was either Fringe or the X Files. I think it was Fringe, 
where this person was able to to be just outside of people's perception. Um, I think this could be a really interesting thing cinematically. Mm. Okay, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Um, Doctor Who does this. Um, he's got that thing, uh, the perception filter, I believe. Uh, there's the, right. the the bit where um, he and Martha and Captain Jack are running around London while uh, the master is the prime minister. And um, he uses the perception filter to prevent people from noticing that, noticing him. It's pretty much exactly what uh, Serafina Pekula does. It's, mm. uh, it's neat. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I love I love her. You know, I I already loved her, but I'm just I just am more just interested and excited by her character. Mm -hmm. So she, the witch, begs for mercy, I guess, to Serafina, really, to a. Um, I have to I have to look up exactly the name that she invokes. But Serafina knows exactly what she wants and what she needs, which is to die. Yambe Aka. Yambe yes. Aka, thank you. And this is only after really her demon is able to break in and, and come back to her. Mm -hmm. They need to be they need to be together when this happens. Mm -hmm. Serafina drops her shroud and kills her and knows she has to fight her way out because everybody's seen her. Uh, and does with some ease, really. She takes some people out. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, she does. Mm -hmm. And then she's she uses her little kanife and stabs some folks. <laughs> then she grabs her her pine and then thwip 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 thwip. She takes some people out with her her bow and arrow. She's a uh, she's feisty. Yeah, yeah. She's tough. The 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 Yambayaka thing though, I, you, I really. Yeah, I keep using the, the term heartbroken today, but again, heartbreaking when she had to put on that merry and lighthearted, uh, you know, um, persona in order to um, make the illusion real for that other witch. Mm. Uh, just especially, you know, considering what she had just seen, what she knew she was about to have to do, and then, you know, everything that she knew she would have to do after that. But for that moment as a gift to this woman so she could die happily. She put on that, uh, that persona. Plus something pleasant. Yep. Really in the midst of all that. Yep. Imagine just seeing that as, you know, one of the members of the church or maybe Mrs. Coulter, like seeing mm -hmm. that all happen in the, in the matter of a couple seconds mm -hmm. and how sort of striking that would be and how crazy that would seem. Mm -hmm. It was, it was wild. Yeah, I'm sure that's why she could get away a little easier. Like, I mean, the shock People of it. People were stunned. Oh, yeah. yeah, the shock of it's like, what? And, you know, and then she, I love when she loses, you know, she loses her arrows and the, you know, the cardinal gets one and, right, you know, and, and a, lot of, a lot of good people get it. But my favorite part is at the very end of that little section, uh, she says, um, in truth, she didn't know where to go or what to do next, but there was one thing she knew for certain. There was an arrow in her quiver that would find its mark in Mrs. Coulter's throat. Mm -hmm. isn't like, that such yes. a, that's such a better way than saying i got a bullet with your name on it mm -hmm. you know like that is just fantastic oh, yep it was awesome oh what a what a turn what a turn yes. of i was like oh man so she um she goes to see um lord asriel's manservant and gets a little more information although he didn't know much he knew just enough he knew one piece of information that, that piece of information is that lord asriel was pretty much anti the authority or anti god mm -hmm. um and he was kind of fed up with it i guess and was going to find out where he lived mm -hmm. basically go to his go to his world mm -hmm. and confront him this is a piece of information that most people would be like uh okay that doesn't seem possible but seraphina takes it pretty seriously and goes to rally the troops and get her clans to do sort of the witch version of a roping mm -hmm. to discuss a plan, although uh, it's not a democracy. They do listen, and everyone has something to say, but she ultimately makes the decision, the final decision. Uh, so uh, what did you guys think of that, how that went down, the uh, the 
the witch's council? Well, before he we, before we jump to the witch's council, I was oh, sure. wanted to think a little bit more about uh, Thorold. Thorold, and um, something that he said about how um, the church wasn't uh, too strong for Lord Azrael. That it was basically the church wasn't a challenge to him. That mm-hmm. it's like, I, you know, forget the church. I'm going a level above that and going, taking it direct. I'm basically, he's going to call their manager. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'd like to see your manager. Karen Osriel has gone to, <laughs> after their manager. Mm-hmm. And he said straight up that, um, you know, he hates God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? And, uh, it, 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 it's not that he's he's an atheist. He believes in God, but mm-hmm. he hates him. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's not something you really you you see very often in my experience. In any case, a lot of a lot of people in the literature, you know, fighting against the concept of God, that kind of thing. He accepts that God exists and wants to fight him. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I I'm I'm so interested in how what Pullman's doing here. Because on one hand, you know, if you look at this from the point of view of, um, gosh, uh, like a paradise lost where, uh, you know, Satan is almost the hero in so much that he wants to do this. Lord Osriel, we've we've established in the last book is no hero. You know, this isn't saying he's this Pullman really isn't saying that God is the villain. That was what I, that was the interpretation I got the first time I read yeah. this read this series. Yeah. But reading this now, I don't read this so much as uh, Pullman uh, casting God as a villain. Osriel's, not, you know, he's not a hero, and the defenders of God, the Church, aren't heroes. He's advocating for some middle ground here, and I'm really looking forward to to reading more to see what that that middle ground is. I, is, uh, I feel like this section here, like he buried the mission statement for the books in this uh, in chapter two of the second book, mm-hmm. which is uh, pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know that Thorold has been with him for a very long time in, in those cha- in that part of the, of the chapters. He says, I know him better than a wife mm-hmm. would know him. Yeah. Um, but there was a little there was a little part of me that was like. Really? You put all of that together on your own, Thorold? Like, I don't know. I just felt like it was an awful lot to have pieced together, even over the time that he's, I don't know, maybe I'm not giving Thorold enough credit. I feel but... like it, the as far as Lord Asriel and what his, his experiments and what he was up to, he probably didn't say it out loud. He just did it. Yeah. But his... Um, how he felt about the authority in the church, the magisterium and God. I bet that's the kind of stuff he mumbles under his breath all the time. Mm-hmm. And if, if that was, if he was going to pick up anything, it would be his disdain for the authority mm-hmm. because that's the kind of stuff that you just kind of bitch about, but True. how he was going to do it and how, what he was going to do, he would just do. But right. that's sort of mm-hmm. like, you know, when I see certain someone on TV, I curse. Right. Uh, you know, so everyone in my yes. house knows that I don't like that person. Yeah. <laughs> when that is actually funny on that, on that note, when uh, that certain person came on TV today, mm-hmm. um, my youngest came into the room and she's like, wow, daddy, you look disgusted. <laughs> uh, maybe I am. Uh, uh, like that's, how, that's how Thorold feels. I think. <laughs> wow. Master Lord Azrael, you look disgusted. Oh man, yeah. So the witch's council. Mm-hmm. How do we feel about that? Interesting. Again, I, Lord Azrael is—is is there anything that he hasn't done? I mean, he's—he's he's traveled the world. He's got a, a witch as as a as a former lover. I mean, mm-hmm. this guy, you know, making him the uh, maybe. I, I'm reading this, and I feel like they're maybe inflating him a bit much here. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. <laughs> even even uh, Grumman gets a little bit of a you know get a little bit of boost here for having like a a, a spurned lover uh-huh. and, and it's a witch as well. Right. It's like, man, these explorers are like players in this land. <laughs> oh my god. Jeez. Wow. <laughs> That's funny. So they uh, they have a little bit of a 
they have a discussion. Serafina talks about how she feels about it. And then this kick-ass witch that I've just like kind of wowed by as a new character, this uh, Ruta Scotti mm-hmm. drops some knowledge and she's a force to be reckoned with. And Serafina super duper respects her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and she sits next to her in the council and has a significant say in what's going to happen. And uh, a plan is sort of put together as to what they're going to do. And um, they did take some of the thoughts of some of the other witches as far as like trying to rally more of the clans together. But Seraphine is going to take a small group through the to the other side. 20, mm-hmm. 20 witches. Plus Ruda, so Ruda is going to be number 21, right? Are going to go and look for Lyra or Lord Asriel? Well, I thought that that Serafina was going to take some witches to go and find other witch clans to join to join them and yeah. to help protect Lyra. And that Ruda Scotty was going to just legit go and knock on, like, not a booty call, but knock, you know, and a text from my ex and like, what's going on? Like trying to get straight answers from him. Mm-hmm. We're overlooking the fact that Lee Scoresby is is at this witch's oh, yeah, council. He's there. Yeah, yeah. And it's the first, it's the first guy like ever. Right. To be a, a, included. You know, they have witch like they have their their whatever, the council, like Dr. Lanis Elias. But like he's there. Like he's literally yeah. in the middle mm-hmm. of it and he's participating and yep. they ask what he thinks. Like that was crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah. They were legit interested in what Lee Scoresby had to say. He weighs in. Like yeah. really weighs in. Yeah. Which would make sense to me if it was the um Sam Elliott sultry mustache Scoresby. Yes. All the witches were swooning. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so and not the chimney sweep for Mary Poppins, maybe not. So let me just read this, and maybe I misunderstood. Serafina picked out twenty of her finest fighters and ordered them to prepare to fly north with her into the new world that Lord Azrael had opened to search for Lyra. Yep. And then Ruta is going with them, and she is going to look for Lord Azrael. Got it. So yeah, they're going through the the gash. Yeah. And there's a uh, in into Chitagaze. There's well, uh, okay, hang on, hang on. Okay. Let's what let's talk about this a little bit. The oh, the bridge to the stars does it lead to Chitagaze? That's where Lyra went. That's where Lyra went, but she wandered around for 4 days. And Lord Azrael wasn't there, and she was right behind him. She it's was true. stuck in the fog for 4 days. Is is does the bridge that he opened is is there? It does it just go to one place, or could it be multiple places? Is it a stable wormhole? Is that what mm-hmm. you're asking? Yeah, is you know, uh-huh. it's like she's sort of she's wandering around for four days. Mm-hmm. She's hungry. Then she sees the city from up on a ridge. You know where where is she coming from? You know where did that open up to? But didn't she see the city when she looked through it from her world? Of course, yeah, we could right. see it. But when she walked through, it wasn't like she was in the city. She was somewhere else. I mean, I, I just kind of read it as she was on the outskirts of town and it took time to get there. But, uh, yeah, maybe. Long time. Long time yeah. to wander around. Yeah. But, but also, uh, with, if he was right in front of her, he, he literally walked across the bridge. But weren't there the things that were um, swiping the adults? From that world, you think he got swiped? He would have been killed. Mm-hmm. They suck them. They suck them dry, mm-hmm. like immediately. True. That's right, because they were they 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 read like, um, oh God, what are those things from uh, from Harry Potter? Like a uh, dementor? dementor. The dementors. Yeah, that's how I again. That's how I read them. She owes so much to this book. She really <laughs> does. Oh man, <laughs> she, she really should does. she should be cutting him a check. <laughs> Uh, maybe maybe it's like in like Ragnarok when Hela is like following Loki and Thor and she kind of like grabs Loki's foot and he goes, Whoa, and he just kind of goes off like 
yeah. you know, somewhere else. Like maybe that's what happens on the bridge. Like you, you, you misstep or step on the wrong stone and you're whoop, somewhere else. Lord yeah, Azrael is on the, is on Sakaar right now. And, and that'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, the Lee stuff. That's, uh, thank you for bringing that up. I would have I would have glossed right over that. Yeah, Lee being there was great, and he's totally aware that it's really really an honor to uh-huh. do this and to be heard. You know, he's he's one among many. Mm-hmm. One among he's one of, he's the only one among many. Um, very, very interesting. And they totally take him seriously. Mm-hmm. So this essentially ends our time with with Serafina. And we go back to Will and Lyra. <clears throat> and they um this is I did find the quote. So she has a terrible, terrible dream about Grumman's head. Right. Um, and she, oh, what? I, oh, crap. <laughs> I'll edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> she, she has this terrible, terrible dream about the head, um, which she wasn't scared of when it happened. She mm-hmm. was in fact intrigued by, I wanted to see again. Um, but in the dream, she's, she's the one that's opening and showing this head. And she's terrified. Oh. She asks the lithiometer what the dream means, and the lithiometer drops this truth bomb. <laughs> it was a dream about a head. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate. I Come feel on. like what is it? Is, is it like when you get to, like when you mess with a magnet and a compass, and it's just kind of like Rrr. like it feels, or like is a lithiometer drunk? Like I don't know. That's what it feels like. Go, go home. Go home, a lithiometer. You're like drunk. when, right? Or like when. When uh, when like Baymax like runs out of battbattery, <laughs> yeah. like, he jumps he out deflating, a window. Yeah. <laughs> like that's what I feel like. What happened to the alethiometer? I don't know. Maybe it's um, Freudian, and uh, sometimes a cigar is a cigar. In this case, sometimes a dream about a head is just a dream just, about a head. Just a dream. Yeah, maybe there isn't much else to it, and she exactly. should just accept it. It's yep. a truth teller, you know. Yep. So they they come across two children. Um, mm-hmm. that are in the town and the children give them a little bit more background about what what is going on. Um, in fact, all the adults or many of the adults that haven't been grabbed are just, you know, just outside of town watching the town through telescopes, um, waiting for these um, specters to leave, which I guess they will eventually. This apparently is something that happens quite often. Mm-hmm. Um, and the kids love it because they get the run of the town. They get to do whatever they want. But even still, there's only two there. Yep. So I guess that most of them are still outside of town with their folks. Yeah, yeah I think that's what I think that's what's happening. Maybe they came in to get supplies or just came in, you know, to get something that they needed or wanted. But everybody else is just out there. And and so I, I love before before we get into that, can I just say something about the way let Lyra and Will in, encounter, encounter each other the second time around. Like that first time around, they're like, you know, Will's kind of like putting her in her place. Why don't you wash your hair? She's like, well, I don't have to pay for that. It's kind of like a little bit of a banter. But when Will goes to sleep, Lyra like, because he told her to do the dishes, mm-hmm. like told her to do the dishes. It wasn't like, would you please mm-hmm. do the dishes? Yeah. And she was like, I'm not doing the dishes. He goes to sleep. She totally cleans it as best she can. She dries it. Mm-hmm. She puts it up. She goes up and checks on him, moves the window so he doesn't wake up with the sun in his face, mm-hmm. and then goes to bed. And then when they wake up the next morning, like she made him breakfast, mm-hmm. this like burnt omelet. Mm-hmm. I just think it's hilarious because their relationship starts to change, and it and this is where it, this is the beginning of it. Um. So I wanted to just state that because I think a little later on there's something else I would want to talk about, but I think that's what's kind of important first is to see how she, for whatever reason, decides to give in or to do what he wants, which is not very Mm Lyra-like. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To be like, sure, I will do those dishes because... So anyway. Well, I think that she sees him, she needs him to find this other Oxford, his Oxford, to find a scholar of some kind to help. Mm-hmm. You know, she wants to find more about dust and she 
I'm not sure that it's so blatant that she's she needs him or is is going to use him to get to his world so she can go and get what she needs. But she she need, she does need him. She needs to find out where this opening is so she can go to this other world. And you know, she you know, he gets her to he's like she needs to blend in, right? So she needs to change her clothes. Right. She's oh she's like he's like a real like kind of low key, you know, dragging her, but he's like, We're clean in our world. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. We take showers. <laughs> and you're not. She said she hadn't had her hair washed since she was at Jordan. So that is the whole book that we read. Nobody yeah, washed right. that hair. Right. And you know how much she sweat wearing those uh-huh. fur, those nasty furs? Do you believe that, though? Do you believe Mrs. Coulter didn't wash her hair? I thought she had a bath at Bullvanger. Yeah. <laughs> but nobody washed her hair. And she didn't know how to do it. She didn't know how to do it. Yeah. That I was feel, just a I rat's like, nest. I feel like Mrs. Coulter gave her a scrub. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Not, she I'm she does level. say that nobody hadn't washed it since she left she left Jordan, but maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. She's not remembering that part. I don't necessarily believe silver tongue. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so she goes and gets clean she gets cleaned up as best she can, which is hilarious. And they go to get some clothes mm-hmm. and uh kind of a pretty woman kind of moment. She goes and gets to you know, they pick out some random stuff and you know, Will has a pile of money that he drops in there. But I love this that he's trying to get her to wear jeans. And right. she says, she's like, not going to wear jeans. No. And she says, they're trousers. She said, I'm a girl. Don't be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Right. But he puts her in like a tartan kind of print uh, skirt to make her look sort of normal. And then they make their way to his Oxford. But again, it's also interesting that uh, even the fashions on this slightly different world are mm-hmm. pretty close to, if, jeans. if not exactly, exactly. You got jeans, we got tartan skirts, mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff. Sleeveless that, uh, stuff, sleeveless yeah. stuff, which is very modern. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, all, but no cars, all those... no Vespas sitting on the side of the road, like which is almost a given in an in Italian this, city. In a Chittagaze, it would definitely right. have Vespas. Right. Though I also did all, like the uh, exploration of uh, the difference in terms uh, between her world yes. and theirs. Love that. The right. Ambaric uh, versus the Ambaro magnetism mm-hmm. and how Electrum is um, Amber. Amber, mm-hmm. you know? Yep. And I wondered if there is some kind of uh, analog or uh, explanation for that in our world. Like why Electrum and. Um, and, and amber could at, uh, at all be uh, interchangeable linguistically. Mm-hmm. Like, why mm-hmm. would that be the case? That was that was kind of that's wild. right. And they're able to converse normally. You know, uh-huh. there's not so much changed that they can't understand each other. Mm-hmm. But yeah, these very specific things have very different names. And he even says that um, what she's looking for is like a theologian. Or yeah, something. Right. And he's like, oh, that's a physicist. Experimental the- theology. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, oh, that's that's a physicist on, in my world. Mm-hmm. Which at 12, I'm not sure I would know experimental theologist or whatever. He's, I don't think I would know that term. Mm, right. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, unless like, unless he was watching Cosmos or something. All right. Time. True. Which he could. He could be. Who knows? Exactly. You know? Though I, I love the term Adam Craft. And yeah. Um, yeah. I want my kids to go to school and study Adam Craft. And even if it's not called Adam Craft, that's what I'm calling it. Keep your eye on all cats in your yard, and maybe they'll <laughs> lead you to a, a an opening somewhere. So they head to our Oxford. They go through the opening. Will this is this is a I feel like Will makes a mistake here, where he sends her through first, and he's like, "You go," and he's not even gonna go. He's just gonna send her. It seems like, uh-huh. and he sends her through, and she gets hit by a car like basically immediately. She does. Right away. And he's like, oh, you didn't have cars in your life? He's like, bro, like, no, you know, you didn't you yeah. talk to her for two days just now? You know, obviously she doesn't. She, she's like has a handful of gold. <laughs> like, the, obviously her world is really different from yours. <laughs> so she get, gets hit by a car literally 10 seconds after she goes into this world, which of course she would. And he's like, don't you have this? She goes, we don't have this many. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, you know, I that they could, had like one. 
you know, that kind of goes back to what we were discussing when we were watching the movie about how empty the world mm-hmm. seemed. Mm-hmm. And maybe that there was actually a reason for it. It wasn't so much that they were, um, they had lazy casting directors. Maybe it was intentional that that world is supposed to seem a lot more empty mm-hmm. than our world. And yeah. they expected that if they were going to do a sequel, they'd get to our world and they'd have the crowded uh, streets to show the difference between the two. Right. Because that line, you know, not so many, not like these, I would not so many, you know, that kind of jumped out at me right away that, uh, yeah. you know, maybe they just have a lot fewer people in Lyra's world. Yeah, this is where you could have your real fish out of water stuff where mm-hmm. she's like, you know, learning and trying to figure out how this world is different you know when they get to the oxford she can't stop talking about this is not my oxford this is different this you know there's a building there so he's like would you just just shh like okay i get it it's different you know but she can't stop noticing all the things that are different about it Mm -hmm. there's this is where the main building for jordan college is and it's not there it's something else Mm -hmm. and she's kind of overwhelmed by that even though she's fully aware that it's a different world she's really put on her heels by how different it is Right, but she recovers from that. She does so quickly. Yeah, like getting hit by a car, she recovers. I know, and she and she sort of like wobbles and 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 Will, who is just used to trying to like cover up or play down, he was like, no, 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 it's okay. She's my sister. We're gonna walk. And he's like, let me drive you. No, it's faster if we walk. Like, just able to sort of cover, try to cover their tracks. He's a silver tongue of his own, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So he's able to do that and. Um, but she does, she recovers quickly in the very last paragraph or so of that, of the chapter of the third chapter, you know, she's, one of the things it says is that Will is kind of taken aback by the helplessness in her eyes. Like it's the first time in, in the time, short time that he's seen her, that she looks sort of like, I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, headlights. And then she recovers pretty quickly. And the last, the last, um, Alex, line there? of that chapter. I'm here. Okay. Is, well, if it ain't here, it was going to take longer than she thought that was all. Like, she just is like, okay, I can't believe this isn't it. It's not here. Mm-hmm. Onward. Mm-hmm. I think it's yep. amazing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That, I mean, you guys both hit the nail on the head. I think you both said it separately tonight. Uh, they're both survivors. So that's it. They're on an adventure. The adventure has begun officially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm still a little wigged out by what the specters are. I'll be honest. Yeah. Are I don't know what they him? are. Yeah. Are we going to see any? I, yeah. And like what the children just sort of like, I want to see, I hope they, I hope they expand on that a little bit as we move into some of the chapters, because the way they make it sound was like, you know, what they do to adults. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Physically, almost sounds like how adults lose their playfulness and joy, and you know, like literally having the life sucked out of them, like mm-hmm. adulting, but like yeah. they're literally having their life sucked out of them. Right. So yeah. That's what it felt like to me, but yeah. So I'd like to see what they do with that. That's, I think, my last little comment. I hope we get some more specters. Yeah, it's so too. interesting that you brought that up. Like, it just, it really feels like now that you say that, you know building on the theme of the yeah, externalization of the things that go through people as they age, you know, as they get older, you know, we've got the, the demons and how they stop changing shape. And then in, in this case, the specters, if they're sucking the life out of you as you become an adult, Oh, wow. Like, I, I wonder what, what Pullman's like saying with that, mm-hmm. you know, because each time in, in both of those examples, you become obviously less of a person than you were. Mm -hmm. Like you're not as engaging. You're not as active. In this case, you're dead. You know, it's just, I I don't think Pullman's got a lot to say about adult, a lot of nice things to say about adulthood. No. And didn't, aren't they new? Didn't they only come into that world because of the bridge? Did I read that? Were they always um, there, or was it something that was newer? No, I think they had familiar familiarity with these things. Uh-huh. Okay. I feel I like they I knew what it. to do. I feel like they knew what to do. 
Yeah, like yeah. I feel like there are like alarms that go off, like sirens mm -hmm. when the specters are coming. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that they went to other cities too. Like, mm -hmm. oh, they're not in your city? Like they seem to know that they were around all over. Yeah. Yeah. But we'll find out when we jump into chapters four and beyond. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us again. We're happy to be back. And uh, we hope everybody has a great week. Talk to you next week. Bye, everybody. Have a good night.